Batman Arkham Asylum was a smash hit when it was released in 2009. After years of bad Batman games, the Cape Crusader finally got the gaming outing he deserved. And naturally, since the game was a success, a sequel followed shortly after. Welcome back to Batman Arkham Thon, where today I'll be talking about the peak of Batman Arkham, Batman Arkham City. During the development of Arkham Asylum, developer Rocksteady already knew what the next game they wanted to set it in Arkham City. They even included an easter egg that went unnoticed for years. In Warden Sharp's office, you could blow away an unmarked wall and inside find a hidden office with plans for the prison. By early 2009, people working on Arkham Asylum were being moved to Arkham City's team as they started to develop its story. This time broadening the scope with a larger world to explore and more iconic foes to face, Batman Arkham City swooped its ways onto the Xbox 360 and PlayStation in late 2011, with a special edition releasing for the Wii U a year later, Armored Edition. But like its predecessor, I will be playing the version included in Batman Arkham Trilogy on Switch. Please don't get mad at me. Well, just like Asylum, let's start with a rundown of the game's story, including Catwoman segments. While this wasn't in the base game at launch, it was always DLC and has been included with pretty much every release of this game since the original. It's hard to imagine Arkham City without these segments. Catwoman tries to steal something from Two-Face but is caught. Off to a great start. Meanwhile, Bruce Wayne is outside of Arkham City protesting when all of a sudden the prison security, Tiger Guards, ambush and knock out Bruce. When Bruce comes to, he's face to face with Dr. Hugo Strange, the man in charge of the prison. He reveals that he knows Batman's true identity and ominously states that Protocol 10 is ready to be initiated. Bruce is then checked into Arkham City and while trying to help out reporter Jack Ryder, he's knocked out and taken by the Penguin and his crew. When Bruce wakens, Penguin starts squabbling about his beef with the Waynes and tries to strike Bruce, but Bruce counters, breaking Penguin's hand, breaking free, and escaping up to the rooftops. From there, he has his bat suit airdropped and he suits up. He hacks into Tiger security comms where he hears Two-Face has Catwoman in the courthouse, so he goes to rescue her so we can figure out what's going on there. After saving her, he starts talking with Catwoman who doesn't know anything. She does end up being shot at though, so Batman follows the shot into the church where it turns out it was set up by the Joker. Assuming Joker is in on Protocol 10, Batman follows Joker's signal to the seal mill and breaks into the office where Joker and Harley seem to be hiding. Upon arriving there, though, it seems Joker is dead, except nope, he's not. He gasses Batman, knocking him out. Meanwhile, Catwoman wants to steal treasure from Strange's vault and escape Arkham City. Exciting stuff. She goes to visit Poison Ivy for help, but ends up being captured. Great. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Batman regains consciousness and has an exposition dump from the Joker. Simply put, Joker is dying because of the remains of the Titan in his blood from Asylum. Mr. Freeze was working on a cure but went radio silent. To force Batman to help, Joker put his own blood in Batman and also shipped out his own blood to hospitals across Gotham. Batman assumes this is Protocol 10, but Joker claims he hasn't even heard of it. He then kicks Batman out a window, leaving him with no choice but to find Freeze. He tracks him down to the old GCPD building, but it seems he's been kidnapped by the Penguin and is in the museum. So Batman goes there, saves Freeze, and stops Penguin and his pet Solomon Grundy. Freeze tells Batman that the only thing he's missing is a certain chemical, which Batman knows he can get from Ra's al Ghul's blood. Or Ra's al Ghul, as they say in the game, but it, it, it's, it's, it's Ra's al Ghul, Ra's al Ghul, one of them, what the fuck? I'm just gonna say Ra's al Ghul, if that's wrong, who gives a shit? And conveniently enough, one of Roz's ninja are in a display case in the museum and break free, leaving a bloody path to where Roz is hiding. As Batman descends the sewers into the abandoned Wonder City, he gets close to dying from Joker's blood, but reunites with his old love Talia, who is also Roz's daughter. Everything here is just so convenient. Batman agrees to take a trial to be Roz's successor, getting a drink that temporarily heals him. After passing the trials, he ends with Roz and ends up fighting him after he reveals all he needs is Roz's blood. Batman gets the blood and takes it back to Freeze, but Freeze now wants Batman to save his wife, which Batman Batman refuses to do, leading them to fight. After defeating Freeze, they realize Harley stole the cure while they were fighting, so Batman heads to the steel mill to face Joker. After a fight with him, Talia allows herself to be taken by the Joker, and Batman gets knocked out because Strange began Protocol 10. Cut back to Catwoman, who is now convinced Poison Ivy to help her. Isn't that convenient? So Catwoman infiltrates Strange's vault, but at the last minute decides to go back and help Batman. So she goes and helps Bruce, who weirdly wants to immediately save Talia, but is told by Alfred of all people to go after Strange first. As Batman tries to locate Strange, he realizes what Protocol 10 was. Strange's plan all along was to act like the prison got out of control so he could bomb it and kill all the prisoners. So Batman ascends up Wonder Tower, taking down Strange's force of guards, and then confronts Strange. And while Strange is monologuing, he's killed by none other than Raz al Ghul. Yup, this whole time, Strange and Raz had been working together. Batman and Raz fall out of Wonder Tower, which then leads to Raz's death. With Raz and Strange taken care of, Batman goes after Talia. Upon arriving at 
the theater for the final confrontation, Talia seems to kill Joker until she's killed by the real Joker. Here, it's revealed the whole time that there have been two Jokers, one played by Clayface and the other being the actual Joker. Batman takes down Clayface and gets the cure back, drinking some, and then Joker attacks him, causing Batman to drop the cure, breaking and ruining the rest. With that, Joker is beyond saving, and as he slowly dies, Batman reveals that he still would have saved Joker. And with one final laugh, the Joker dies. Batman leaves Arkham City with the corpse of his arch nemesis in his arms in a really powerful scene. He then walks off, presumably returning to the prowl as if nothing happened that night. Oh, and a Catwoman story. She plans to finally leave the city, Two-Face tries to blow her up, she goes to the museum and defeats him, and he tells her that he stole all of her stuff and hid it around the city. I am so glad we had all that Catwoman stuff in there. The story of Arkham City is sublime. Trying to tell it concisely is a bit tough. It's not a long story, but there's a good amount of depth. It's a really engaging narrative that is a fantastic continuation of Asylum story. The dynamic between Batman and Joker in this one is fascinating. I didn't mention it last time because I didn't find it crazy relevant, but in these games, well, except for one, Batman and Joker's actors reprised their roles from Batman the Animated Series. Mark Hamill as the Joker, and the unfortunately late Kevin Conroy as Batman. And these two are, in my opinion, the best actors to ever play their respective roles. Conroy has this very distinct voice. It sounds perfectly deep and menacing for Batman, but as Bruce, he does the professional billionaire really good as well. Of all the actors who have played Batman, Kevin, in my opinion, has had the best voice for the role, and his role in these games, the animated series, and every other thing he was a part of cements him as my favorite Batman actor. It's absolutely heartbreaking that he's gone, but I'm thankful he played the Cape Crusader for so many years. And then we have Mark Hamill as the Joker, which always confused me when I was younger. This is Luke Skywalker, Mr. But I was going to Station to pick up some power converters. converters! But man, like Conroy, Hamill may be my favorite actor for this character as well. Again, we've had some great actors actress for the Joker, Jack Nicholson brought the silly chaotic energy, and Heath Ledger. He had this a weird thing where he wouldn't stop licking his lips. And as I said, these are good actors who did a great job, but Hamill's performance, man. He reaches the chaos of Nicholson's Joker with the over-the-top ideas of Ledger's Joker to bring us the best of both worlds. These two are truly a dynamic duo, an incredible Batman and Joker duo, and once again, it was absolutely crushing to hear of Conroy's passing in November of 2022. It says so much that Mark Hamill is retired from the role due to Conroy's passing. After all, who would the Joker be without his Batman? These two legends would reprise their roles once more in Arkham Knight, but I mainly wanted to talk about them here because this is where so many of their best moments together occur. The way they play off each other is so, so good. And this moment... Do you want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, I would have saved you. <laughs> that actually is pretty funny! <laughs> These lines have always stuck with me. The ending with Batman carrying Joker's body out of the city is so powerful. It mirrors the opening of the game and is one of my all-time favorite images in Batman's history. This is a moment that has stuck with me ever since I first beat this game. And speaking of which, why not reminisce on my history with this game? It's deeper than any other game in the series. Now my first full playthrough immediately followed my playthrough of Arkham Asylum, but my history with this game dates back to, I want to say 2014. I was visiting a friend of my dad's place and he let me play his son's Xbox 360. He had a bunch of the games you'd expect, Halo 3, Call of Duty, Gears of War, but one stuck out to me, the damn Batman game. Yep, he had Arkham City, so I started that one. I didn't get very far. Far. I remember saving Catwoman and uh, that's it. I think I got stuck figuring out where to go after that. I may have skipped the cutscene, but I didn't make it that far. But the very little I played enamored me and it sat in the back of my head for years. So five years later when I started City, I had that slow realization. Wait a minute. I've played this before. It was awesome seeing the rest of the game for the first time. But do remember, this was still on that crappy old computer, so it looked like this. But again, 
I didn't care. That's how good this game was. Gameplay wise, it expands upon the foundation that Asylum said. It's still a Metroidvania, but this time in an open world. Yes, you now have Arkham City to explore and it's okay. Now it is really cool to have a city setting to explore as Batman and traversal is so much more fun than Arkham Island. There are constant grapple points to grapple and glide from. Traversal here is vastly improved, although the world design is a bit odd. It's this weird horseshoe shape, so when you go from one side of the map to the other, you have to do this big loop around the base of Wonder Tower, which is weird. But Arkham City is way cooler to explore than Arkham Island. Like last time, there are a ton of Riddler trophies scattered around, each one of them unlocking concept art, character trophies, challenge stuff, whatever. And there also is a series of side quests that you can follow as you get the trophies, but I've never really bothered doing it. As for other things that return from the first, the combat is here and still as amazing as ever. It still has the fantastic counter system and free flow combat, not to mention all the new tools Batman gets in this game that gives you more potential in combat, and especially the Predator segment. When an enemy with a gun sees you, you can drop one of these to create a burst of smoke. You can of course escape, or you can even use a temporary cloud to defeat an enemy quickly. And then the rest of the new tools, like Mr. Freeze's Jammer, which can be upgraded to jam guns. I love picking off enemies one by one, leaving one left, jamming their gun, then dropping down in front of them just for them to realize their gun is jammed. It truly makes me feel like I'm a threat to these guys, someone they should all fear. But these Predator segments were also very prone to jank. I'd say even more than Asylum's were. They could still be fun, but I also found myself getting very frustrated at them. And speaking of fun but also frustrating, the Catwoman sections. As I mentioned earlier, this launch has paid DLC, but is included in like every re-release, but man could you tell this game wasn't designed around her. The first Catwoman segment is the first bit of gameplay where you just beat up Two-Face's thugs. While her moves are different, at the end of the day, it still comes down to pressing the attack and counter buttons. The second part is after Batman is knocked out by Joker, it's when Catwoman goes to visit Ivy and she does, fighting a bunch of thugs, then gets captured. Then she disappears for a few hours. This happens like an hour into the game and she doesn't reappear until like the last hour. So cut to when Protocol 10 starts and Batman gets knocked out. Poison Ivy agrees to help her, so Catwoman breaks into Strange's vaults, takes care of the thugs, grabs the valuables, then is faced with a choice. She can leave Arkham City and leave Batman to die, or leave Strange's valuables behind and go help Batman. Now you can just leave Strange's vault and the game can end right there. But it just rewinds after the credits and you're forced to make the choice again. And lastly, as an epilogue, Catwoman goes back to her apartment. Well, that was an anticlimactic way to end her story. Well, Two-Face did rig her place to explode, but cats have nine lives, so take that. After Batman defeated the Penguin, Two-Face took over the museum, so she goes there, defeats Two-Face, and he reveals that he spread her belongings all over the city. Let's hear it for random padding. So after you beat the main campaign, you can switch to and play as Catwoman whenever. Man, I wish I was fun. I hate her traversal. She uses her whip to grapple, but she has to climb, and you have to press these at the right time, and I I can never get the timing right. I'm only ever too early or too late, and it's so annoying. I appreciate the idea of giving you another character to play as, but man, I wish she was more fun to play as. Well, on the positive side, let's talk about the boss fights. There are only a few, but they are some of the best in the series. First off is Solomon Grundy. You have to destroy these generators to weaken Grundy. It's a fun fight where you run around, quick fire explosive gel on these generators, then you beat the hell out of him. He keeps regenerating, and there's some quick time events that, while our tad line game, play wise, they're a cool spectacle. And man, the final beatdown on Grundy is awesome. Then after beating him, Penguin starts firing rockets at you so you just run over to him and beat him up. Not the most exciting boss, but I still greatly enjoy it. Next up is Ra's al Ghul, which is so, so good. You fight him in a weird wasteland where you have to fight a bunch of clay soldiers with one of them being Ra's. After narrowing Ra's out, he does this, and you have to quick fire electrical charges at him when there's an opening. Dodging the blades and timing the blasts are so fun. Then he pops out of the ground and you have to rapidly counter his attacks and it occasionally cuts back to the real world and it's just so bad ass. Then a bunch of soldiers pop out of the ground all with counter markers and you gotta spam the counter button to counter them all. This fight is an awesome spectacle with really fun gameplay and visuals. It always stuck out to me. Then we have Mr. Freeze who- ah! Oh! You have to approach his counter like a predator section using stealth to attack him. But each attack you use, he integrates a countermeasure so you can't use that strategy 
strategy again. When you've played this game so many times, it's a quick fight. But man, the first time around, it's so cool scanning the environment, trying to find new ways to attack him. Then there's Joker, where you have to fight him alongside a bunch of thugs. This is like the ultimate test of your combat abilities. Having to fend off like every type of enemy in quick succession, it's a really fun fight that feels so good to beat. You can maybe count Hugo Strange as a boss, but all you have to do is stealthily take out some guards. But the actual final boss is Clayface, who is big monster to end the game on. It's not a hard fight, just dodge and throw ice grenades at him. Occasionally you'll pull Raz's sword and slice him up, which is pretty cool. The second part of the fight happens down in the Lazarus pit, where you slice up clay goons with a sword, then throw ice at Clayface when he gets up. As I said, it's an easy fight, but a fun one to end the game on. The bosses here are way better than the bosses in Asylum. I adore every single one of these fights. I won't defend them to the grave and be like, The Solomon Grundy fight in Arkham City is one of the best fights in gaming history. But man, are these fights fun? Well, past that, there isn't a whole lot to Arkham City. There are a bunch of side quests, but I never really bothered dabbling in them. Chaz mode is here again and really damn cool. Not only can you play as Batman, but you can also play as Catwoman, Robin, and Nightwing. They all play a tad differently, so it's a fun way to add some spice to challenge mode. Other than that, it's the same song and dance as Asylum. Character trophies, concept art, character bios, the works. Arkham City is... A sequel to Arkham Asylum, and a damn good one at that. So much so, I consider this the peak of Batman Arkham. While the two following games were great in their own rights, Origins wasn't a step forward, and I do have more issues with Night than I do with City. City just nailed pretty much everything. A fantastic story, great gameplay, combat, exploration, collectible, side content. It really was more proof that Rocksteady knew how to make a Batman game. As I said, Origins and Night are great, but I find City to be the most consistently good game in the series. Arkham City will always hold a special place in my heart, regardless of how bad this box art is. Like, what the hell am I even looking at? And considering that I see it as the peak of Batman Arkham and it's only the second game in the series, that means it's only downhill from here. <gasps> Poor me.